can just go on. And... All right, so thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, I'm speaking with um, Omar Scherer. Did, did I pronounce that correctly, your last name? That's right. Yeah, That's perfect. right. Yeah. So Omar is uh, one of the founders of Make Hijra, uh, which is a website uh, where basically they share resources um, about uh, supporting uh, Muslims uh, when they are doing Hijra or their journey. But maybe before we jump into this topic, it would be great if um, Omar, you could give us a brief understanding what actually Hijra means, because maybe some people are listening who are uh, very new Muslims, or they haven't heard this um, uh, this uh, word before. So, can you tell us more about what is actually hijra and where does this concept come from? Okay. Um, well, uh, you have the you have a general meaning of hijra. What's it called? A um, it's called um, it's called well, it's just a general meaning. And then you have a legislative. Okay, so if we talk about the legislative, it means to leave the land of disbelief and move to the land of belief. You mm -hmm. want to say that? Uh, we we kind of we discuss it in a general sense, but it also can be taken in a legislative sense. But we discuss it mainly in a general sense, which is just to leave one environment and move to a better. So to leave off of a worse situation and move to a better situation. Uh, we don't get too much into um, the, the, um, the technical Islamic um, rulings and things like that because we're not, we're not really qualified to do that. So that, that's a question for someone who has a higher uh, Islamic education. But generally speaking, if you live in a place where you find difficulty um, practicing your religion, and uh, you want to move to a place where you can practice it in a better way, it's arguable whether that's in the same country that you're in or you have to migrate to where uh, the Muslims are. So that whole subject, I would say a person that's interested in the topic to go to someone they trust and discuss it in more detail. I'm talking about someone that has some Islamic knowledge to go and discuss it more detail in more detail with them. Uh, before they make their intention on what they want to do in terms of history. Mm -hmm. Got it. So when you talk about difficulty, uh, what level are we talking about? Because, for example, you have the Uyghurs in China who are being oppressed uh, systematically. Then you have like, kind of, for me, it's difficult here because there's like three halal shops and like few Muslims, but there's practically no one here. And then there's like um, maybe some countries who are mixed, like there's Muslims, Christians, and like 20%, I don't know. So what difficulty do you think, I, I guess it depends on the person, but do you, do you think is enough for somebody to consider doing this uh, hijab? Because it's a big step, right? You have to leave like uh, your country or culture or whatever. So what would you, do you have any thoughts uh, on that? Yeah, I have thoughts on it. Um, but again, uh, I'll pre preface it by saying, um, a per it's every individual has to, <clears throat> do their own due diligence in this in this topic, and they have to discuss the issue with someone that um, they trust the Islam their Islamic knowledge. So we all may have different conclusions after mm -hmm. doing that. Um, but generally speaking, um, if you if for example, I can only speak from uh, let's say my perspective in my country, and um, in my country, it's very difficult to raise children. Uh, in an Islamic way, because your environment is plagued with different um, uh, uh, illegal things, Islamically illegal things, like alcohol, uh, drugs, um, uh, homosexuality, um, lewdness, etc. on and on and on. So for me personally, uh, I felt that it wasn't a good idea to raise my children in those environments and while risking um, losing them to these type of vices that are there. So everybody's situation is different. Like you may live in a suburb where you don't face those same issues, or you may live in a country where um, you can practice your religion freely and have your own communities and whatever, and you don't have these type of um, problems plaguing you. So again, it's really up to the individual to say, look, am I having difficulty in practicing my religion? Should I be in this place? You know, all of this, 
again, it needs to go to someone with a higher level of Islamic knowledge to advise you on what's the best course you should take. Because it could be you, but you're able to practice your religion, but you're living amongst um, you're living amongst people that don't have your best interests as a Muslim, or that that place could be at war with Muslims, and you're on their mm-hmm. side. You know, and so it's it's not it's not an easy um, answer. It's something that requires a person that really genuinely wants to know to go search out the information and then make a decision based on that. But me personally, like. I enjoy living amongst uh, Muslims. I enjoy living in Muslim societies. I like to see Islam practice in communities. Uh, so for me, like leaving my country, okay, maybe I thought I liked the trees and the grass and it's, you know the neighbors were nice or what have you. But I value more um, the living amongst Muslims and practicing religion. It's easier. It keeps a lot of vices out. You know, for I'm gonna give you one more example before I conclude this point. Uh, you, you have in our community people that are Muslim that maybe have converted to Islam, like yourself, and maybe before Islam they were drug addict, drug addicts, and they end up leaving. They end up coming, becoming Muslim. Maybe let's give a scenario. Let's say that they they were in prison, for example. They come out of prison, and they were former drug addicts, and then the only place they have to go is back into the environments they came from. So it's difficult for them to control or to maintain their Islamic identity while they're indulging in those activities that, that got them in prison in the first place, for example. So they become, they're strong Muslim when they come out. We see, we see this a lot, strong Muslims when they come out, but once they get back into those environments, they slowly, slowly, slowly go back to what they were doing before. So to leave those environments, what helped them to maintain, um, maintain their Islam and their practice. Yeah, no, I agree with you because like when you first start practicing, at least for myself, it's like a completely new way of life. And but after a few months, you get to a level where, okay, well, I can't move from here because like, for example, Islam is not just a personal religion. It's also like an economic system. It's also a political system, military law, there's Sharia, you know, so like you can't have these benefits of Islam on society in a non-Muslim country. You basically are only utilizing the personal let's say um, or individual like let's say islamic uh, <laughs> belief but uh, on, a, on a more macro level there's no way you can practice it and so for me when i went to turkey i went twice this year i went to istanbul for 10 days and to antalya and it was really a game changer because I was in Turkey before as a non-Muslim, but now it was like, you know, you can hear the Adan, you can hear the, mo- everywhere is a mosque, right? Uh, you can, everything's halal, you know, it, all these barriers are removed and, you know, w- women cover up, you know, and it's like, okay, well, this this is better in a, in a way, even though there's like this cultural barrier, right? But uh, so, yeah, uh, for someone like me, it's like a new, new way of looking at society, right? Would you agree that like to... You, you are limited to some extent if you live in the States or Europe to practice because on those macro levels, you, you're you never going to see the benefit of Islam, basically, probably. I would say it's definitely a challenge. And then I would say that the people that should be there are those people that are inviting others to Islam and people that are maybe stronger in their Iman, et cetera, that can deal with these these different uh, uh, obstacles there because some of these pe- some of the guys that are giving dawah in these things or the imams and the massage and stuff they they're not in the society like you are like some of them come from another country mm-hmm. and they are just in the masjid and they're just dealing in the community but they don't have to go and work in the in, in the uh, factory or go work over here when they're dealing with people that have a uh, a heavy influence on what you do day to day. You know, so like you have to ask permission to, to go to Juma prayer, for example, or uh, you're in an environment where people are talking lewd, speaking, you know, about things they shouldn't speak about, you know, their, their relations with women, et cetera. So I've, I've lived that. So it's not something that, you know, it's not like something I'm making up. I, I know that. So to get around a situation, like you said, you went to Turkey, you're not going to find, it's, it's, you have to search out people like that. Generally, you do, you're going to have people that culturally are have Islamic manners and morals. So they're not talking about the girl that they slept with, uh, come over here and let me, let's drink some wine together and stuff like that. You have to find those people. They exist. 
but you have to find them. And then some countries are more lenient than others. Like Turkey, you have to go to a place where uh, th those things are less, because like, yeah. you'll find alcohol and prostitutes and everything in Turkey as well. But uh, you really have to search those things out. It's not something that's just in your face. Like, it's, it's, I'll, I'll tell you a story. We were in the masjid, this was years ago, maybe, maybe 20, 20 years ago, something like that. We're in the masjid and they're given a, a class. And the way the masjid was set up is that it has uh, glass windows looking out into the front of the masjid. So it's big, huge glass windows that you can look outside. So we're facing those glass windows while um, the imam is giving a lesson. And then a man comes out from, comes out from the side of the masjid, completely naked. He's completely naked. And the women and everybody can see this man standing there completely naked. <clears throat> so it's like, you know, in reality, you have to, you have to have Islam in it. You have to have your Islam in an environment that supports it. You know, you're the masjid and next to you is the, the crack house or the drug house. And across the street is the liquor store. And, and where down was the this? Street, prostitutes on the corner. This was in Milwaukee, in Milwaukee, oh, okay. Wisconsin. But I, I still remember it like it was yesterday because mm -hmm. it was such a shock. And you had your family and your children. And this guy comes out of the, the, the side of the masjid completely naked. No socks, mm. nothing, just butt naked, like we say. So I'm saying that to say, like, uh, I mean, and, and that's, that's not, that's just one story. I mean, there's many stories like that. But the point is that to change, to change the environment, if you care about your family and you care about your family's future, and you say, okay, well, what's the most important thing to us, really? Like, is it to be this successful doctor or the successful engineer? or whatever, that I have to give up everything in order to, to be successful in this dunya? You have to ask. That's not to say we leave it off, because when you come to the Muslim world, they're engineers and doctors and everything else there. And, but their mentality is a little bit different. You know, like you, you're doing this to contribute to society. You're doing this to benefit the people, which is a, a lot different than a person that's doing it just to fill it, you know, just to make his pockets bigger, you know, just to make more money, have a big bank account or what have you. And then at the end, you just leave it all behind. And then a lot of us, a lot of the, um, especially immigrants that come, they end up losing everything. They lose their children. Their children don't identify with being Muslim. Uh, they change their names. And then they, you know, they, and then if you could imagine generation after generation, it just at some point just go, it disappears. Mm -hmm. You know, your whole Islamic identity is gone after a few generations. And all for what? Because you wanted to come and you wanted to make more money and you wanted to build a house and you wanted to have drive a fancy car, et cetera, et cetera. And the funny thing is that you can still have a nice house and you can still have a nice car if you put Islam first. And that's the, the main motivation for me personally to get out of those environments and swell the ranks of uh, the Muslims. Yeah. Do you think, uh, because somebody might say, well, look at the first Sahabas where they were actually sent to these non-Muslim lands and did the opposite, right? They went to, the, to do Dawah and invite to Islam. So do you see also the possibility of the opposite where someone, let's say, grew up with the society, became a Muslim and they, I don't know, start changing the environment or build a mosque or, you know, just start establishing some sort of community locally where there's nothing basically um or do you believe i mean it's subjective again because it depends on the environment but uh, do you see also that side of the uh, coin or would you suggest maybe uh, to do hijra for most of these let's say reverts or um or people like that yeah i mean it depends it depends if you know where you stand and i think this is a big problem that we have where we don't know our place and if we all played our positions, we have a better world. Like the guy, the, the bread man, the baker, shouldn't be the one that's trying to give lessons in the masjid. He knows, bake, he knows how to bake, right? He doesn't know Sharia, he, does, he didn't study anything. He knows a few Arabic words, so he leaves the bakery and go gives a, a lesson in the masjid. No, it, sh it shouldn't be that way. The guy is a mechanic, he's an engineer, he's a this. Let him be the best mechanic the best engineer and he plays his position in society. So you do have people that are uh, callers to Islam, 
But to be a caller to Islam means that you have, you have to have a certain level of knowledge. You can't just be anybody that read a book and now you're going to be the caller to Islam. And another thing about that, because people may misunderstand what I'm saying, it doesn't mean that you don't give uh, advice if you can. Like if you have a certain degree of knowledge and you see something that you can uh, change or that you can influence, that's a different thing. But to go on and take on, take on the role as a dawah carrier requires that you have a certain amount of Islamic knowledge in order to lead a community, um, uh, establish a masjid, lead the prayers. Like you can't, you can't lead the prayer if you don't know al fatiha for example. You don't know how to pray, so how can you lead the prayer? So yeah. yeah, there is a need for people to go and give dawah, but those people need to be trained to a level where they can take on the responsibilities that come with that. So if that's not you, then why, why are you there? I mean, you can stay. That's up to you now. Like me personally, I know where I stand. I know why I, I know myself more than anybody. I know that I don't know anything, you know, in a deep level. I have some knowledge. Maybe I'm, I'm more educated than the average person. But at the same time, I'm not in any position to call myself going and giving dawah and stuff like that. That's, that's not my position. I play a different position. And then also bear in mind that I'm, I'm a person that took on a, a family. So I look at it like, okay, I need to stop the cycle because I come from a cycle of fatherless homes, drug addiction, prison, criminal activity. This, this is my community and where I come from. That's not everybody. So I don't want people to misunderstand, but my, my, where I was going before Islam was leading in that direction. So I need to break this cycle. I need to make it so that my children don't even have the opportunity to join a gang because there's no gangs. Or yeah. if there are gangs, we don't know about it. The drugs, if there, there are no drugs. There are no open drug markets. Where I'm from, there's open drug markets. You can just go to the corner and get drugs. People will come up and ask you, do you have, do you have drugs? They ask you for, uh, for it. It's just open and, and everybody knows what's going on and nobody's doing anything about it. So to raise my children in those environments, I no, I'd rather not. That's personal. Yeah. 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 Me as a I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not telling you to do it. No, no, no. That's something I don't have any kids that's something so far. That you so, have yeah. To decide. yeah. That's something you have to decide on your own. Yeah. Don't uh, you have so to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. When we talk about these, let's say these ideas of uh, alcohol, drugs, uh, uh, you know, maybe women, uh, homosexuality, whatever it is, that's sort of like a liberal umbrella of uh, of the world. Don't you think it's also kind of going into the Muslim lens now where even they are being sort of exposed to this at some level, not at this level that in Europe or the States, but there is some influence already. Do you see it heading in the way where maybe in 10 years, 20 years from now, it could be, um, you know, uh, like in Turkey, for example, it could be similar or, of course, this, in Saudi, it's probably going to be very different. So it depends on the country. But do you see that influence already in those countries or do you think it's not going to work in Muslim societies? Okay. Let me let me give you some real examples. I'm new. I'm new to Turkey, so um, I can't speak on Turkey with any real knowledge. But what I can say is that you, when you have a culture and you have a culture that promotes marriage and it promotes moral values, et cetera, it's difficult to pop up in there and try to, and try to go against that. It's, it's really difficult. So here, for example, where I'm at, let's say that in America, it's common to see a guy take his shirt off and walk down the street with no shirt on. Mm -hmm. Right. If you do that here, you're going to have a problem. And it's not that it's not like the person's the most Islamic. It's just that that's against what we do here. We don't do that. So they have a culture and the culture is based in Islam. Even if a person doesn't know much about Islam, it's just been passed down and passed down and passed down. And these are our norms. And this, these are our things that will be considered taboo, et cetera, et cetera. Like you're not going to just push up on somebody's daughter. It, just, it doesn't work that way. And that's here. That's here. And now I can give you specific uh, um, situations in Egypt, for example. Uh, there, was, uh, there was a girl. This is, you can look this up. I forgot her name. But it was a girl that was promoting um, 
uh, these apps where the girls go in there and they talk to men or what happened. Yeah. She was promoting this in Egypt, but she was saying, she was saying, look, you can make some good money. All you have to do is talk to them. You don't have to take your clothes off or anything like this, et cetera, et cetera. And people caught wind of that. And this girl got arrested for this and they gave her 10 years in prison. So yeah, you, you can try it, but see what happens. It's different. Like if you promote it immorality, Regardless of the governments, we, we're not even talking about the governments, how to, you know, placed in their, in their position and blah, 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 on and on. We're talking about the society, the, the culture of the people that's like, look, we don't care what you say, but this is what we're going to do. Like if these people come in, do, there was a guy that was uh, from Australia and he was, this was in Egypt, and he was, um, he was hired in a school and he was sleeping around with the not the teachers, maybe the teachers' assistants, the the uh, the lower level staff in the in the school, mm -hmm. and and he ended up getting one pregnant. And when that happened, he had to run. He had to leave the country. But you have to understand <clears throat> where I'm from. We had a we had a nursery in the high school. That's crazy. Which means for for the young girls that so many young girls were getting pregnant that they put a nursery in the high school so that they can still attend high school. So that's where I come from, right? Over here, no way, no way. So if you, it, it goes on, don't get me wrong, but it's like, it's like, it's the opposite. Like there is common over, over here is uncommon. They, they do it, but it's, it's, it's hidden. You have to go and find, you have to go look for that. Over there, that's just the culture. So you have to go and find people that are, have more value, you know, people that are, Look, when I was growing up, you if you were a virgin, you had to lie about it. When I was growing up, you couldn't say you were a virgin. You get made, made fun of. But being a virgin is common in these places. Don't get me wrong. There are people that are not virgins. But I'm saying it's the opposite extreme. So there's one more thing with, when it comes to like the LGBT stuff, right? In Egypt, there was a concert. This happened years ago. And there were some LGB people in the, in the audience and they were wave, waving the flag, the rainbow mm -hmm. flag. They came and arrested all of those people and put them in prison. So it's just, it's, it's just certain things, it's certain things that could have happened. I don't know. <clears throat> I don't yeah. know if it, could, if, if it could penetrate like it does in the States where now, I'm a man, but I can tell you right now on the, on live, on the camera that I'm a woman and you have to accept me as that. That's what's yeah. happening now. Little kids, little kids can say a boy can say, no, I'm a girl. And if you don't accept them as being a girl, you're going to have a problem. Like you get a backlash. You know, this is the type of conversations that are happening in the States right now where you're, you don't have children, but when you do, you'll, you'll understand, understand this a lot more that my son can't come home and say that he's a girl. You have to understand that. Like that's, I don't care what anybody says, you know, it, me personally, you can't come home questioning whether you're a boy or a girl. And, and that might, it might, might rub people the wrong way, but I have to be honest. So in order to, in order to think this way, you have to put yourself in an environment that goes along those same values that you have. Or else, look, you can tell your daughter, Look, you got to wear the scarf. She can say no. And she can go to a higher authority and say that my father is making me wear this scarf and I don't want to. And they can come to your house and take your children. Mm -hmm. This is America. I don't know how it is there. But I'm saying in America, if you say, look, if you force them to pray, I don't mean violent. Like you're just telling them, okay, it's time to pray. This They can say, no, I don't want to pray. And if right. you force the issue, they can go to the to what they call social services. They can go to social services and say, my father is forcing me to pray and forcing me to do this. And then they can come in your house and take your children away and put them in another, uh, put them in other people's care. Yeah. So here, one last point on this, I'm sorry, but in the Muslim world, your children are your children. Nobody interferes with what you're doing as far as being a parent 
in your house, unless you're doing something that's illegal, you know what I mean? Or you're doing something wrong. But if you're just raising your children and, and encouraging them to be good Muslims, nobody's gonna bother you with that. Yeah, I even noticed in Turkey that I couldn't see many homeless people. Like I was looking for them and there were not many homeless people. And so I figured that like the family structure is so strong that even if somebody from family is a drug addict or somebody is a, whatever, is not doing well, the family is gonna take care of them. They won't end up on the street. Like here, I see homeless people everywhere where I live in Prague. It's the dirtiest city in the world. Like you're from Milwaukee. So I guess that's, I've been to Milwaukee. I know what's, how it looks like. Oh, you know so, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's like, you know, it definitely, like you can see the, I could see like maybe one or two homeless people in my entire stay in Istanbul, which is crazy for such a big city, right? So right. you definitely see like, okay, there's like a bottom-up society. So like people are not forced from, the top government to do something. It's just in people from Islam or from culture to, to do these things. It's moral, right? So yeah, it's a different system. And that's Turkey, right? That's like the most liberal Muslim country, I guess. Bro, listen, uh, it, it, to be honest, and maybe somebody can argue, can argue this, but society is really from the bottom up. And then you have people, and that's why, you know, when you look at it, people say, oh, these are dictators and this, that, and the other. They're kind of going against what the people want, right? But the people, is, it's, the, the government can say, hey, you can, you can put your mom on the street and nobody's going to put their mother on the street. <laughs> you have to understand that the law doesn't really matter at that point <laughs> because people are going to do what they do according to their culture, which in most cases, in terms of Muslim countries, are, is an Islamic culture. They're going to do it. Like, for example, Polygyny in Turkey is illegal. It's illegal to have more than one wife, but people still have more than one wife. It's just, yeah. that's just what's happening. They're not gonna stop it. And then on top of that, you can face up to two years in prison if you marry a, another woman. People are still marrying other women, it's there. It's like, and we're gonna do what we've been doing. <clears throat> Once they introduced secular, secularism into Turkey, well, part of that was to say, okay, you can only have one woman, blah, 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 to give women rights what, what, or what have you. But at the end, culturally, this is what people were doing. They've been doing this and they just kept on doing it and they do it up until today, 2022. Yeah. So yeah. that's one example. But I mean, just getting back to your point as far as the homelessness thing that you have to understand is deeply embedded in culture to take care of your mother and your, your parents. That's Islamic. You're not gonna put your parents on the street. Mm. You're not gonna do it. And, and the, thing about, the thing about Western culture is it kind of breaks down. And I've seen this even, I'm, I'm 40, 45 years old. So I've seen this when I was young, people taking their parents when they get old and putting them in an old folks home. And we call it a nursing home. Once they get a certain age, you put them in a nursing home so you can go live your life. That's common. But what you find in the Muslim world is that your 80 year old grandmother lives with you. Family is important. So all these are Islamic values. So why, how would you, how can it po be possible that you find your grandfather on the street begging for change, homeless? Yeah. Well, yeah, he's uh, conflicting with my freedom. So yeah, in that sense, it, it makes sense in their mind to just, you know, he's limiting yeah, my freedom. So I'm going to let him go. But you know, think, can... well, think about something. Think about something just, just as a bit of it, right? You can't remember when you were in the arms of your mother. And I'm not saying you yeah. in particular, just in generally speaking, you're in the arms of your mother. She's breastfeeding you. She's, she's feeding you. She's lifting your head when you can't lift it. She's changing your diapers when you can't change them. When you have to just use the bathroom on yourself, she changes the clothes. She gets up and walks at night when you're crying and you can't go to sleep or you have gas in your stomach, she's burping you. And at the end of the day, because you want to go live your life, you're going to put her out on the street? Yeah, that's crazy. She could, have did, she could have did the same to you, right? She said, look, I don't really want to deal with this, so I'm going to go live my life and leave you over here. So, And that happens. It happens, by the way. People giving their babies up for adoption. Abortions are crazy now in the States. It's just ridiculous. It's like a form of birth control now. You accidentally get pregnant, you get an abortion. It's just normal. Mm -hmm. People throwing the babies, leaving the babies places. Just leaving them in the garbage can, throwing them away. 
Yeah, we have we have an ad down there's a bus station and there's like, did you get pregnant? Get call this number and get like an abortion or whatever. A ranger, you know, it's like in society, like, hey, this is just an accident. Like it happens. You're just creating new life, whatever. It's not a big deal. Nothing, <laughs> you know, it's just crazy. Bro, at the end of the day, listen, we will destroy ourselves. Like you don't need, you don't need any wars. You don't need anything. At the end of the day, if we don't follow what our creator gave us, we will destroy our, ourselves. And you can see that happening in the States. People don't want to be pregnant. A lot of women are not even mothers anymore. They're not, they're, they don't want children. So if you don't have children, if you don't reproduce, then you're going to die. Yeah. So you just, you just, you're killing yourself. Whereas a lot of Muslims that have big families. I know Muslims with 10 children, six, seven, eight children. That's common. They, they reproduce. Do you, do you see what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. if, if people don't reproduce, then of course they're just going to die out. Yeah. And then when they have when they have children, they reproduce a type of child that's similar to them, which doesn't care about anybody but themselves that, you know, the type of crimes that go on. Anyway, we can we can go on forever with this topic. But the type of crimes that go on is, I mean, the way we use each other, the way we look at material things, the, the name brand things and all that. And we'll do anything to get it. We'll steal your money. We'll, we'll, we'll rob you of this, we'll take your name, we'll scam, we'll make a credit card in your name, we'll do this, all just to have a shirt that says Tommy Hilfiger or Gucci or what have you. They'll destroy themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I guess, yeah. On that point, just maybe one last thought, like people act like not having sex is not an option. Like it is an option. It is an option. You can, everybody can do that, but it's just looked upon weirdly but essentially if you didn't have sex you wouldn't have these pregnancies like logically speaking right so like why are you doing it you can have it halal when you get nikah and married right so like you know it, there's a way to do this and uh, it's just like you can't your desires are taking over right you can't just help yourself so yeah i get that but like there's a there's a way this is a solution but it's difficult of course but yeah it's just something uh something but you know what check this out bro listen because i think i think that i speak so i speak about this with so much passion because it's not a theory to me this is something that that i've done and i've raised children outside of the states and i see a difference between those children and other children and that of a child of a boy like my son two of my sons are married Mashallah. So mm -hmm. they were virgins up until that point. It was, it's strange not to be. Like when you raise them in an environment where everybody's getting married, if you want a woman, you marry her. This is, these are the environments that you raise your children in. When you talk about certain moral values, they can, they'll listen to you and look outside and find the same moral value. It's not, not like you're in, in, a, in a Western country where it's talking about marriage and this, that, and everybody has a girlfriend. Everybody has a boyfriend. It's like mm -hmm. you're going against the grain. You're going against the grain in these places. You come here or in the Muslim world and you find that your, what you're telling them matches what they see outside. If, if I say it's time to pray, they hear the van loud and clear. So it's, it's like, okay, yeah, you're right. It's time to pray. Mm -hmm. But in the, in the Western world, you're the only one praying. You send them to school and you tell them, though, you have to pray and this, that, and the other. And they're the only ones praying in the school, two or three of them. Out of a thousand students, two, three, four of them are praying. Yeah. So it takes a certain type of personality to, to be able to survive a situation like that without, without succumbing to uh, peer pressure and what's going on around them. Mm -hmm. So last point, many, many of my close friends that we, we, we became Muslim together, uh, we were learning Islam together, and they, they uh, they really tried to raise their families in, in, in good situations. But bro, a lot of them, you can see it in the girls mainly because they're the ones that have to carry a baby. <clears throat> so they come home pregnant. Teenagers. Muslim teenagers. And they're pregnant by non-Muslim boys. And this is, and the thing is that you don't know how long they've been doing. It. It's just that this time they got pregnant. Mm. So you send them out the house, you, you have an Islamic environment in your home, 
you send them out the house and they get eaten by the wolves very easily. And the boys, we don't, we, we can't really talk about the boys because you don't know what's going on with the boys. The boys could be doing the same thing. It's just that they come home, you don't know what they're doing. So I'm just, I'm just saying all that to say, like, this is, this is really my argument for the subject of Hijra. Of course, there, there's an Islamic point of view. I'm talking about, this is really Islamic as well, because it's about our religion and trying to maintain our families, et cetera. But there is a legislative point of view or a, a obligation, obligation point of view, but I'm not speaking from that. Like you can go to the local imam and ask him his opinion, get several different opinions and you can find out. But let's look at the reality that we all see. Mm -hmm. Got it. Uh, would you have any advice for making like a smooth transition into a Muslim country or maybe some of the obstacles that uh, somebody can uh, face? Because I guess if somebody is like a Pakistani origin and they are raised in the UK, all well, the natural choices go to back to Pakistan or whatever they have. But like someone like me, I have no Arabic language, no culture, no Islamic background, nothing. I'm white. Where do I fit? Right. So like, what do I do? Or how would you then maybe kind of help out with these um, uh, with this transition or what uh, what can we do? Yeah. OK, so let me let me say this first, that uh, I haven't found a perfect place. So I just wanted to be clear on that, because sometimes people will go and they see problems. And when they see the problems, they run away from it. Mm -hmm. But uh, so I haven't found a perfect place. There is no perfect place, but there's a better place. There's a better place. So so how do you how do you start off the journey? Uh, the first thing the first thing you need to do is, um, of course, assess your situation. Look at your situation. Uh, see how you. I mean, some people after watching this, they might say, well, I never looked at it like that. Well, I never thought about it that way, you know? So they have to look at their situation and say, okay, is this something that I really need to do? That's, that's first and foremost. And then uh, after that, they need to go seek some counsel. Go talk to, some, go talk to somebody with some Islamic knowledge to, that can kind of steer you in the right direction, give you a proper perspective. So somebody might say, you might go to you might go to uh, an imam or something, and they say, uh, you know what, it's not you don't have to do that. You know, you can stay here; it's no problem. You know, whatever. Somebody might say that, but at the same time, you can um, you can still make a decision and say, no. If, for me, I've been here my whole life. I know what it is. I don't want my children and family to go through the same thing. I'm gonna leave. Okay, that's that. First, you have to make a decision, right, and make your intentions clear. After that, then you have to start lowering your expenses as much as you can lower your expenses as much as you can eat eat the cheaper things dress the cheaper way right uh get the cheaper rent if possible get into a situation where you can roommate with four or five people go to some some of some of these guys maybe they're immigrants and they just they're just working and trying to save money and they have five or six people in an apartment if you can handle that do that lower your expenses as much as you can because you're gonna need resources in order to survive. If you're educated, then you have more options because you can go to the golf and you can go to these places that pay good salaries and you can live in the Muslim world and make a good salary there. But then also you still have to have, to have a plan for when it all ends because your contracts are in and they'll tell you to leave. So you have to have a plan for that. So basically it's building your resources, getting up enough money for you to actually travel and see things as well. Because it's, the first step is not just to move. The first step is to explore. So go to different Muslim countries. See if, see if you can live in these places. Some places you can't live. It's just too hard. All depends on where you come from. Some places are modern enough that the standards are similar in, in that place and where you come from. Other places are way low. Like, you, you know, you really have to get used to living in that type of uh, situation. But to each his own. Everybody's different. So you have to explore. So you have to build up the capital to be able to free yourself from the nine to five and the mortgage payments and whatever you're doing, the high rents and the expensive bills and expensive shoes and clothes and all that. You have to free yourself from that in order to take those resources to go and explore. <clears throat> I'll tell you something too. Uh, Allah is our provider. We know that in theory. But when you make these type of moves, you know it as a fact. It's a fact. You go to a place, you don't know how you're going to sustain yourself. I'm not encouraging people just to go without a plan. But 
Allah is going to take care of you, whether you're there or you're anywhere else. You have to know that. That's a fact, right? And then you have to ask yourself. Some of us, some of us had hard, hard times growing up. A lot of us didn't. A lot of us never missed a meal. So we have to think about that. Whether we tried to get it or not, it was always there. Allah has always provided for us. He don't, he don't leave us like that. So why would it change if you move to Turkey? Why would it change if you move to Egypt or wherever? So again, but at the same time, don't plop into a place without a plan, right? So that's the thing, explore. Once you find a place that's suitable for you, then you make plans to figure out how you can sustain yourself in, in that place. So those are the main steps. And then so like for me personally, like I can go somewhere else after this. Like I'm in, I'm in Turkey, but maybe, I, maybe after a few years, I wanna go somewhere else. It's no problem because I like to experience different cultures, different, uh, different Muslim cultures. I like to experience that. I like my, I like my children to see it because all they know is a Muslim world. Yeah. That's, that's, their, that's their default at this point. So taking them to other places, they just, it just opens, broadens their, their scope. So that's my general advice, inshallah. I hope that, I hope that people can benefit from that. So, yeah, definitely, inshallah. I guess the biggest point is the language, right? Or the culture of it, because if you hop too much, maybe it's too much uh, changes, right? So you, so you have to kind of get settled in one of those places for a while. Uh, yeah, but uh, I get I get. How many point. languages do you know? How many languages languages do you know? Well, I I know like three native. Well, English is not my native, but I speak very pretty okay. Um, but I know some right. German, some Russian, and then Slovak, Czech, and all that. Yeah. Now imagine imagine that it was you speak very good English in my opinion, right? So the effort that you took to learn the English language, why couldn't someone take the same effort and learn Arabic? or learn Turkish, right. why not? You yeah. know, so, and you say, you know, three. So you, now you're talking about children. If you have children going around, they can speak whatever. I know uh, one my partner that's part of the Make Hijra project, he, his daughter knows like, she, she learned Swahili, she knows English, she knows uh, Malay, she may know a little Arabic, like it's nothing for them. And they speak it perfectly, by the way, no accent. So mm -hmm. like this, that's not really, I mean, it may be a concern for people my age, like for me to start to learn Turkish and speak it in a good way, it might take a lot of, a lot more effort than it would a, a young child. But still at the same time, there's another point and then, because I'm kind of long-winded with this, but we don't have to go to places and be the only foreigner in the city. That's something to think about too. Like building communities is a, is a good idea. Like to get people, and people are doing it all over. You have the Somalian community. I'm talking about here now. You have the Somalian community, you have the Afghani community, you have the Syrian community, all in their little areas with their own food and their own thing. And then when you, you can speak to them in their, low, their main language and you can speak to them in Turkish. Yeah. So it, it just, it goes to say, I mean, for them, it may have been a different reason. Like maybe, maybe they had problems at home, they're refugees or something like that. But that's not always the case. Some people came years and years ago. You have Afro Turks, which are basically African Turks. You have them in places like Izmir. You have them. They came long time ago, but now they're just Turkish. They like speak Turkish, everything. They look different. Yeah. That's how you can tell. So I'm just saying, like to come to come to a place, you shouldn't. It's not. A, it shouldn't be. The language shouldn't be uh, something that's scary. Because you can always find someone, especially if you, you can find a medium language, which could be English. If you speak Arabic, it could be Arabic. And then you have to take it slowly and, and, and learn the language and learn how things work. And that's that. Yeah. Would you say that, for example, I have a family that I need to take care of that's not Muslim, right, in my country. Um, and But I also want to experience the hijra in some sense. And I'm an entrepreneur online. So I, all my business is done digitally. I, I can work anywhere. So in that sense, would you say even, let's say, three months here, then six months back home, three months here, would that be considered some sort of hijra or, um, you know, that may be the starting point to it? Or, you know, 
would you because you know i don't want to completely abandon let's say the family and i know somebody's dying and i want to spend time with them before so you know you know people have different situations and um do you think that's also like an option <laughs> yeah i mean that's that's a, <clears throat> that's definitely a question for like uh, because i would be more concerned about that islamically like what are my obligations towards my family etc uh so i would i would consult uh, any ma'am or a sheikh about mm -hmm. that. But at the same time, like um, it, it depends because some people have deep family roots and some people don't. Like it's not, it's not uncommon where I come from for a person not to know his father. It's not yeah. uncommon. To know your grandfather is a plus. To know your great grandfather is starting to get rare. And then it can go further to where it's like impossible. I don't know anybody past great, great grandfather. But then you have families that are well, well grounded, rooted in the place. The whole family's there, the extended family's there. So it becomes more complicated when you decide you want to make Israel, right? And I'm talking about people that converted because your family may not, may not be Muslim. So, but you may have a grandmother or an aging mother or something that you need to care for. And maybe you're the only one that can do that. So those, those situations require uh, talking to someone that can that can give you some better advice with that, but for me personally, I just take them, take it with me. They're not Muslim, you know, and I have real experience with that, you know. Uh, and, and as a result of that, they become Muslim sometimes. That's so, awesome. yeah, without you being the preacher, because when I first became Muslim, I was the preacher. I was the person that was I was hard, and it didn't work. But eventually, they became Muslim just by living with us. They've been right. living with us for like almost ten years, and they became Muslim. Just looking, looking, it's obvious. <laughs> I mean, certain certain things is just like, come on. They see, they look at, they're looking at their family, and then that in in the Muslim world, for example, and then they look to the other people they still have contact with, and they have all kinds of problems. This one got pregnant. This one's not married. This one's on drugs. This one is whatever. They have all these problems. And, they, and even their friends tell them, oh, you're, you're lucky that you, you left. You're not missing anything here. Yeah. So, so that, that's a point that I would make. If, if, of course, if it's just like a mother or father or somebody that you bring them to, bring them to these places and they can see the difference like night and day. Mm. Yeah, I guess the the dawah to your own family is the hardest one, at least from my experience. It's uh, yeah, it is. by example, it is. they don't want to listen to you. Logical, yeah. <laughs> yeah. They don't want to listen to you. But the thing is, you're not by yourself. You know, at that point, if you if you have family, you have let's say your wife. You have your when they start seeing the babies come, you have the children. The children will start talking to, you. and then you have people, you have friends that you meet, and they want to talk to. You. That's, that's what you'll find as well. Like they'll say, oh, can we talk to your mother? Or can we talk to your father? And then their way is just, it's a little slightly different than ours because we're just hardcore. We become Muslim. We just, you know, we, we, we don't have no wisdom when it comes to delivering the message. But these people, they, they're different. They show by example, you yeah. know? So, so that would be, that would, if I could recommend anything, it would be, look, if you have a, a non-Muslim mother, a non-Muslim father, or, you know, it can't, you can't bring the whole everybody. But if you have <clears throat> like that, I would take them. Some come live, with, come live with me over here. I take care of you over here. They'll find that it's cheaper. That's another thing. Yeah. Like, so I, I remember seeing my mother crying at the kitchen table, writing checks for bills, crying. Because it, just, it was just every, she worked so hard and everything goes to paying this mortgage and this car payment and this this that and she's just crying like uh, what she have left and then when she when she come, comes to the muslim world it's like she owns everything there's no debt yeah so, i know that very well yeah so yeah, yeah, yeah. oh well thank you so much omar for sharing uh, all these uh, valuable insights with us uh, jazakallah care and uh, hopefully we'll get oh, yeah. a chance to uh, to catch up some other time, maybe even in person. But uh, thank you so much for this. Um, and everybody go subscribe to Make Hijra channel or you can watch more of uh, Omar's videos uh, and get more advice uh, because this is a topic that people are looking into. And I think there's not many, um, uh, you know, uh, people out there who are giving this advice. So it's very valuable. 
Uh, so thank you for that. Yeah, no problem, man. Anytime.